This is Scaling Sustainability Impact, a Siemens podcast for industry. While we work on setting up some great guests for you from voices around Siemens, our partners, and even our customers, we are releasing some previously aired conversations from our other podcasts. Today, we are tuning in to an episode of our automotive series, On the Move, to talk with the VP of Automotive and Transportation Industries at Siemens Digital Industries Software, Nan Kochar. And joining him is Aaron Devola, Head of Sustainability at Siemens Digital Industries. Let's dive into how the automotive industry is working to achieve sustainability standards and goals. So, it, you know, as we move into the future, sustainability has clearly become a priority in the automotive and transportation industry. Um, so for Aaron and Nand, I'm, I'm curious how this is impacting the overall strategies and priorities of automotive companies. And um, on top of that, do, does it make industry partnerships more important to success? Yeah, I think what you're seeing so much, especially in automotive and transportation, and really those industries that are tied to consumers, they're really um, aware of the market environments around them where you see trends around legislation coming, you see commitments um, around net zero and the Paris Agreement for that 1.5C limiting. Um, Those aren't as far away as they used to be. And uh, companies are really looking for those strategies to implement and execute to become more sustainable in what they're doing every day. The other thing as a manufacturer that becomes very apparent is that your own emissions and your own impacts within those factories, within those buildings is one level, but you have to really be looking at both your scope three upstream, which means your supply chain, and your scope three downstream, which is what's happening with your, your products during their use phase. And in the case of automotive industry, they've really taken a a great approach at looking at that scope three downstream with the invent and the um, really the scaling of electrical vehicle um, production and um, participation in the market. Yeah, Connor, I agree with everything Aaron said. One additional point is uh, I think the companies, automotive companies, have recognized to make a business case out of the sustainability um, to be a viable business for a medium and a long term, not only just a short term benefits. So it is adding a lot of value. It's the right thing to do. It's not only just the in the past was a mandate from a regulatory requirements and meeting the criteria and emissions and so on. But now companies have realized that sustainability is the right thing to do for their business, um, both from a brand recognition perspective and delivering value to their end customers. So that's a very important aspect. And to deliver that partnerships, no one company can do such a big initiative on their own. So partnerships have become very important and they've recognized that. And Aaron touched on partnerships could be at a very upfront stage of digging the raw materials with the mining industries, uh, at the tail end partnerships with the recycling and and the reuse of stuff because not every OEM and automotive company have the entire vertically connected chain. So they built partnerships so they can address the sustainability in a holistic sense. You know, Nand hits on a really interesting point there, which is that the role that some of these partnerships really play. And I think the first one is as we look at some of the legislation and look at some of the targets, there is not yet the landscape that has a common language or common definitions or common calculation methods. And what we're seeing in automotive in particular with organizations like Katina X is really competitors within the same industry coming together and saying, hey, what's our language going to be for our industry? And how do we drive that in the first space? What are the, the rules of the game, so to speak? And then the next place where those partnerships come Um, come in handy really along the value chain is now that I know what I'm trying to count and how I'm going to count it, we really don't have all of the transparency to these really varied environmental impacts. And that's another place where being lockstep with your supply chain, with your distributors or how you, um, with your dealers, how you're bringing products to market, and then really understanding how your consumers are using those products are critical to having those full life cycle impacts. And you can't, no one enterprise can do that alone. You really do need to have a network or an ecosystem of partners working together to really be effective here. Mm -hmm. So I I think one of, you know, we we talked a bit about um, 
uh, sort of business goals for automotive companies and how sustainability plays a role. Obviously, one of the other big things that a lot of these companies are targeting is autonomous vehicles, um, hence the topic of this podcast. Um, so I guess I'm curious, you know, how do these things synergize? Do autonomous vehicles play a role in the sustainability ambitions of these automotive companies? Um, you know, do AVs bring any advantages in the pursuit of environmental goals? You know, from my perspective, there's been a couple of articles, but not really nearly enough studies done on, on what autonomous vehicles mean to transportation. But I can share with you all that I have a 16 year old driver at my house and how he operates a vehicle, I'm sure, is not optimized for fuel efficiency. And this is one of the things that we can really think about quite a bit is how you operate that piece of equipment has an impact on its environmental um impacts, I guess, to use the same word again there, but really being able to look at and optimize for those parameters alongside performance, alongside um, range and safety is really, I think, a key to where autonomous vehicles can really play a, a bigger role there long term. Um, and, and it's a complicated problem to solve. And I think that's where a lot of the tools and data management that comes in um, is there. But I think Nan might have a lot more technical information to share here. I, know I fully agree. So, Connor, as you know, a timeless vehicle comes with all the basics, what's needed for constant learning and constantly updating and making a next generation of vehicles better than the ones before. So it is the sensing technologies. It's the processing of all that information and then reacting to that information. So autonomous vehicles, by the definition, come equipped with all those data collection modes, and now companies can either collect the driver behavior, just like Aaron's example. They can also collect a lot of other information from a traffic standpoint and uh, driving behavior standpoint, and propose based on all the computing power, which is on autonomous vehicles, what the optimum solutions are, what the next generation of vehicles need to be modified with, etc. So that's why autonomous vehicles play a big role in overall delivering the sustainability. And again, it might not be a single silver bullet. It's a combination of all these little things you can add up. And as things evolve, companies find a ways of leveraging that data, that information, which is available uh, for free, so to say, uh, now since all of the equipment is already in, the, in these vehicles. And I think it's important to note that for a vehicle, the environmental impacts during that use phase are the most significant impacts. So anything we can do to ma manage those and optimize them, as Nan outlaid there, can have a bigger impact. So let me, um, Aaron, we tend to focus on how digitalization and digital twin technologies and all the other digital tools can help overcome the engineering challenges of the future. Um, in your mind, how does digitalization and the collection of data empower companies to achieve sustainability targets while maintaining profitability and keeping up with the pace of innovation? You know, we look at digitalization or becoming a digital enterprise as the how supporting the why of sustainability. And, and I think about this and I had a conversation um, just a couple of weeks ago about how hard the role of a design engineer has become. You know, if you go back 30, 40 years, they were looking at performance, maybe a little bit of quality, but really weren't thinking about design for service, design for manufacturability. And now we've got design for sustainability coming in. And so we really are adding more and more parameters that we need to manage to. And this is where data management and having a very comprehensive digital twin that can speak to performance metrics, can speak to geometry, can speak to the physics of a, of a product at the same time as those, those environmental impacts is so key. Because you're not trying to deliver just one thing. You're trying to deliver products that are better, that are faster, that are more profitable and more sustainable all at the same time. And, and, and I know it, it sounds like an almost impossible job, but I think the technology is there to really help people make those better decisions in the future. No, that's a very good point. So it's not only a digital twin of product during development and manufacturing, it is also during operations and then having a closed loop process to provide insights. And that's where we, I think, end up leveraging a lot of the IoT 
and analytics technologies to get that closed loop processes continuously updating and refining the models for next generation. Um, let's switch to now upcoming government regulations. They'll have a huge influence on automotive industries uh, sustainability initiatives. Now, how can digitalization help automotive companies comply with these new regulations? So from my perspective, there's a few things that really stand out. The first is really driving that transparency and connecting data. You know, I was at Climate Week just a few weeks ago, and I listened to this really great speaker talk about taking collective action and how we need to take action as an ecosystem. But that action really needs to be based on some collective intelligence. And that collective intelligence comes from taking these data sources, getting more um, complete and more comprehensive information, and then being able to make decisions that drive um, sustainability impacts wherever they go along that particular life cycle. And I think that that's an interesting thing as you look at regulations is that they want to have the, what we've seen at least in the EU, is that there's a drive to hold the manufacturer responsible for those emissions cradle to next cradle. And to do that, you need to understand what those impacts are, both in the supply chain phases, in the phase when it's inside your factory, and then what's going on in the use phase. And pulling, using digitalization to pull those data sources together to point to the right decisions from that data is really what we mean by leveraging collective intelligence and being able to say, we understand what's going on from end to end and now I know where I need to work to optimize instead of doing these smaller, more localized optimizations because you only have a segment of the complete picture with the data. So I think when we have those regulations, what they start doing is providing us with transparency. But once we have that transparency, now we've got the power to really make huge impacts. Well, that's a very good point. I think when um, I was in the industry, we were always optimizing for cost and it was always making decisions of what the landed cost of the parts is going to be no, no matter where it is being built. So you could start to take into account. And I look back and say our CO2 calculations or the environmental impact is equally important just the way we calculate or measure cost. Uh, it impacts the same way where we build the parts and what it takes to build those parts from an environment perspective. So that's that's a very good point. Well, and it may be interesting if you're if you're a podcast listener today, maybe you love podcasts as much as I do, but there's a great podcast that Malcolm Gladwell did as part of his revisionist history, um, where he talked about the environmental footprint of a load of laundry and how the best thing that Procter & Gamble, the manufacturer of detergent, could do was look at that whole load of laundry. And what they learned is that the largest environmental impacts were happening with by heating the water to run the wash cycle. And so the most impactful decision they could make was to make their detergent work just as effectively in cold water. And that's one of those impacts you don't see if you're only looking at what's happening with inside your factory. So maybe that's a, a good example of what, what, what I mean when we talk about looking at that whole life cycle. And I think with the autonomous vehicle, that's really within that driver behavior that has an impact that you want to have more control over. And I think that this is one of those ways that we can really drive those overall impacts by managing them and optimizing for impacts alongside speed or safety and all the other important impacts that you're looking for out of an autonomous vehicle. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Scaling Sustainability Impact, a CMED's podcast for industry. We'll be back next week with the second half of this discussion. But until then, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes and learn more on our website with the link in the description.